Hi guys, welcome back to my Steps to Sobriety, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. Today is another day for a great interview. I have got uh, Nefertiti San Miguel with me. Nefertiti is a mixed media artist and a woman with many, many talents who has been using her art over the years to deal with her own demons and deal with the challenges in her life. And it's beautiful to have her on the show, to learn from her what worked for her and how to wear your scars and your uniqueness, your authenticity as a badge of honor rather than trying to hide the scars. So welcome, Nefertiti. Welcome to my show. Hola. Mm. So happy to be here. Thanks for the kind invitation to be part of the spotlight in your podcast. And it's a beautiful thing. We are international indeed. You are in New Zealand and I am in Boston, Massachusetts, United States. (laughs) And thanks to the wonderful technology of these days, here we are connecting very casual and having a great time. And Isn't it feeling like I just met a new distant relative? <laughs> and, and it is like that, isn't it? It is it is intriguing because due to a mixture of COVID and a mixture of just being 2020 being a crazy year, we we are like-minded souls that have found ourselves on the internet uh, in in an attempt to to showcase ways of how we can improve our lives and therefore others and it's beautiful so we can we can actually make connections with people that we normally would have never come across so it's actually a blessing in disguise and i'm dead excited to to talk to you about art and about the the many many costumes you wear now i'm always against masks and against costumes because i think you know let's be raw let's be authentic etc but in your case, that's a little bit different because, <laughs> because you do so much. So how would, you, how would you describe yourself? Who are you at this moment in time? Because we are all developing. But in this moment in time, how would you describe right here, yourself to right a friend? Now, yep. It's 2020 in the middle of a virus apocalypse. I was expecting zombie apocalypse because that's what I have been trying for in years past, being part of Halloween hunt productions. But we have to adjust, you know? So right here, right now, after a lot of challenges and wearing and juggling at the same time, many, many different hats, I am downsizing, I'm going a little bit minimalistic, rocking my style, my gothic, as you can tell. And I am a very happy person. Right now, I am the party and the holiday. That's how I carry on my days and bring it out to everybody around me, whether it's virtually or in person, whatever the case might be. Very proud of my accomplishments, especially this year, in spite of all the challenges and the chaos and cancellations as we have spoke before and you are well aware of it i am a mixed media artist and a performer me march all my special programmings got canceled up to may 2021 and i was seriously sinking into depression over losing the greatest part of my life performing live for people and delivering smiles So I have to reassess that and I have to go on my personal quest, how to fix it, how to adjust to what is current in the landscape, make it happen and come up on the other side, shine and bright. And that's what I am. I'm very happy. And that's, I mean, (laughs) you just described a hell of a journey just over the last six months and uh, (laughs) with a smile on your face. But I think it's important to realize that there would have been moments there when the word, I have been sinking in a depression, are so meaningless because they pale in significance when it comes to the dark feelings and the dark, the dark the fear, the fear of existence. Here's where your money comes in. And suddenly you had the rug pulled from underneath your feet. 
So this is scary and uh, it's so important to talk about that because right now in the United States and worldwide, there will be so many livelihoods that are at stake. At least the livelihoods that those people knew prior to COVID. And it is such a key thing that we see these challenges and obstacles as something to reevaluate our own lives. This is not the end of everything, even if your job disappears, even if the world that you know has disappeared. That does not mean that you will disappear. It just means that one fire has been raging and has burned down your, your, your life as it is. But you determine if you want to be a phoenix or if you want to be a victim. And that and I, I have think to tell you <laughs> that I have been chanting that recently. I have been actually saying that to a couple of people in my environment. I am bonding with the spirit of the phoenix bird. That's exactly the words. So I'm bonding mm. with that energy. And it is, it is brutal. No one wants to be in that situation. But at the same token, in my daily life as an anesthetist, I see that again and again and again. A big part of my, my daily life is to anesthetize with a shoulder surgeon. So those patients have, are typically very active people. They are either in the gym or they are, they are working hard here in, in, in Rotorua with being mechanics or being in the forestry, etc. And now they have had a shoulder injury. And it's not like in the films. You get sh shot in the shoulder and then five minutes later you make passionate love with the heroine, the, the nurse that looks after you. Nah. You've got a shoulder injury, that means that you, first of all, are in pain. Secondly, you can't do your normal things. Then finally, all the diagnosis is made. So a quarter of a year has just passed until you come to your surgeon. Then he does surgery. Another quarter of a year uh, will pass. The first six weeks in a sling, and then another six weeks learning how to use your arm again. That's half a year of your life out from typically a situation where People are active, active, yeah, macho, I can do it, because that's what we are. Yeah? And to suddenly stop, nothing happens for six months. And I see that again and again, and people's lives fall apart. So the same, the same emotions that we have just touched upon, the frustration, anxiety, where's the money coming from, fear of existence, all these things. It's, there are so many people out there who you don't have to lose your job in COVID. It could be a simple injury where exactly the same things apply. It is, it is a huge challenge and you have just gone through. I mean, you, how, what was the flow of events? You knew suddenly, damn, everything is canceled. And initially there would have been fear. How did you deal with that fear? I have to do sort of an analogy. I felt like doing a white water rafting expedition. I was having a great time. Everything is looking wonderful. You are enjoying the scenery. You are getting naturally high on life. I was on the spotlight. I was performing. I was partying. Oh, you name it, I had it on my hands. So then it's like you get thrown overboard and you are just like drowning. Who's going to pull you out? Is somebody left on the raft that is going to get you back in? And you start looking around and you just have to manage. You have to figure it out. How are you going to survive that episode and get back on the raft and enjoy what you were enjoying and don't drown because literally it's either sink or swim and we are not sinking here. So <laughs> you do whatever it takes to get back on that raft. And that's what I did. But it was extremely challenging. I was going up and down like a roller coaster. Um, I could manage three hours of happiness. Then I will be what we call in Buddhism, monkey mind. That monkey mind was working overtime 
And then you start wondering, well, is it really going to work out for me? It's not looking good in the rest of the world. And do I sing with the rest of them? And it's not a good place to be. But again, we have two choices. Either you manage or you go under. And for me, the going under is not an option. So we have to be resourceful and we have to come up with ideas. And that's what I started doing. I love being on the spotlight. That's my passion. That's my life. And I will be doing it until the end of my days. There's no question about that in my mind. So I have to figure out how I was going to compensate for the losses of stages and life events. And I went on a quest. What are my options? How can I get out there? Everything's going virtual. I'm not thrilled about going virtual, but if that's the option and that's the new reality, well, I will have to get used to it. And that's how we met in the virtual world. And after going through all my challenges and ups and downs, I have told people in my close environment that I am happy with the result. And if it wasn't because I had been forced and force fed to change and adjust and look at possibilities and new options never explored before, I will have to give up my passion, which is performing and being on the spotlight. And that was not an option for me. And that's how we end up attending to the same virtual events and connecting in the same Facebook group. And a few months later, here we are mm. having this conversation via Zoom. Mm. Mm. But I think it's really, really good that how do you describe that, how you describe that forced change, that forced transformation that you certainly didn't choose, but that was on the cards and it was either sink or swim. And I guess that's the, the key thing, the, the fear and the negative emotions that you have experienced and that many of us experience, they are normal. It is absolutely okay to be shit scared. It is absolutely okay to be depressed and down and out and to grieve because you have just lost part of your life. And that's okay. It's absolutely okay. On the contrary, that's normal that you actually feel like that. Oh, I have to do it. Mm. I, there were nights that it got to be 3 a.m. in the morning and I was crying my heart out like I just lost the love of my life. And it, it was beyond pain. It was beyond misery mm. and suffering. Mm. But it comes down that you have a duty and obligation to yourself. Nobody else is going to do it for you to pursue happiness and make the best of every situation. And that's the only option. There's no other one because uh, science, yes, it suits a purpose, but it's not going to rescue you all the time. And the government is not going to come and rescue you. And the relatives and employers, nobody's going to do it for you but you. So mm. the obligation and the duty is from you to you and make it happen. So absolutely true. And I guess that's the key thing. For me as an anesthetist, I have learned in my professional life to always expect the worst and to always have a plan A, B, C, D. And once I come to plan K or plan Z, I typically am running for the hills. But up until <laughs> then, I'm well prepared. But that's that's not how many people live their life. And that's the sad thing. I've, I've written my, my Steps to Sobriety, which is uh, a book where, where I describe my journey. But the key thing in that book is, whilst it is talking about alcohol and how I got my, my act together, if you look at, at sort of what the, the separation is, the first part there is alcohol and the 12 steps, how I got clean and, and action plans. But all that, that's life. That's all that is, is dealing with challenges. And actually, 
realizing that daily challenges and weekly and monthly and new new things hitting you square in the face, um, that is normal. And to actually put some some bit of thinking into it and actually say, well, okay, what was to happen if you lose your job financially? How do you go about it? So there's a chapter in there where I'm actually discussing exactly that, where I'm I'm saying, well, okay, we have talked about depression earlier in the book. Let's actually look at it and, and say, well, you know, if you or someone you love, when the mood goes down, well, what do you do? Where do you start? And all that is such an important bit that we all never learn in our lives. It is very few people have got the opportunity to get that exposure to to learn that. That's and that exposure was for me rehab. I learned all that, and then in the in the journey of my last seven years, most people out there don't have that opportunity. Certainly, the schools don't teach you how to recognize depression and and uh, and action plans, how to get out of it, or talk about PTSD or talk about X, Y, and Z. So this is where you guys need to realize the challenges will happen, and then listen to someone like Nefertiti and 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 me to sort of figure out, okay, how did these guys do it? How did they end up on their feet? I have to tell you that I I have kind of a theory and I kind of pick by anybody else but myself. But I from young age was like that hybrid between the black sheep, the odd dog and the black cat. So the label of misfit that it will be just on the conservative side. But that comes with two perks. One, you have to tough it up. And two, you have to pay the price to be you. But you are already conditioned from young age to manage pretty much anything that it comes your way because you were misfit. (laughs) And I'm okay with that. So <laughs> I see that you are laughing. <laughs> Probably that's kind of ringing a bell at your end. <laughs> it certainly does. <laughs> it certainly does to, at at times. And but having said that, the, whilst I was at times, I felt like a misfit. And I guess every every young man and every young woman out there feels not right in their body, and that's that's why where young. People often get so anxious and get so get so frustrated about not fitting in and not finding their, not knowing who they are. And that's part and parcel of it, isn't it? I mean, when you're young, you don't know who you are. You you test the waters, you try a bit of that, you try a bit of this, and today you're going to go, oh, I think I like Buddhism. And then tomorrow say, no, no, I'm a Catholic. And then and three days later, you, 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 you think about Allah. And that's just religion. Then leave alone all your, your style. We all do that. And luckily, most of us sort of find their way. And, and, but I, it took me a long time to accept that I had flaws. It took me a long time to accept that I'm, uh, that I'm broken. And I've got a lot of things wrong with me. And that it's okay to be like that. You had that much earlier than me. <laughs> no, I think that the difference here is that I didn't have the same level of acceptance as you described. My acceptance had to be that I have many talents and not too many people can see it. And I have to stick to my passion and pursue those talents. Can you imagine if back in the day, Michelangelo will be limited to just one job or to <laughs> one craft? We wouldn't be enjoying the so many things that we're enjoying today. That's true. And I always had passion for many different fields and I will go from one extreme to another and I will wear people out because I was so inquisitive mind and very hyper. I want to explore. I want to travel. I want to do all these things. And 
I joke about it after many, many years that I have felt for the longest one, like E.T. phone home. <laughs> I am the alien here on Earth, and now I'm being like punished, and people are trying like to sort of study me. What's wrong with you? And now I just take that to a different level. I go and teach people. <laughs> you see, I'm open to what I have learned. It's like, okay, you want to study, you want to explore, you want to hear it? Mm. Sure. I'm 100% open about all that and then some. Let's go for it. And how beautiful is that? If you can actually accept your oddballness, your, your uniqueness, your authenticity. This is your quirkiness, which makes you you. That makes you gorgeous that makes you wonderful and that is something that nowadays i think is getting at times a bit lost because people put always the same mask up and always they look the same and they they want to have that perfect social media appearance and they 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 do not accept the real them which is my the way i think about them it's it's really people actually believe in what they put out there. They believe that this mask is actually real. And then their world breaks apart when that mask chips off a little bit here and there. And suddenly people actually realize that, mm, no, you are not all right. And no, your life is not perfect. So it is the, yeah, I, as I said, nowadays, I'm proud to be the oddball to have that crazy Halloween display out there where I go uh, stage production style in front of my house. And it's cool. I love it. I like it. I wear it. And it's a badge I wear with honor <laughs> whilst everyone else looks at you and thinks, oh my God. And no, that's fine. You are, oh my God, because you're not coming out. You're not showing the craziness. You're conforming so much that, that you have forgotten who you really are. Or you maybe yeah, never people, even found out. Well, people are calling their Sam short. And that's a pity. Why are you going to cut yourself short? Mm. If you don't go on and unleash the creativity, and that's one of the things that I bring into my educational programs, unleash the creativity. Because it's very sad. I get people from all ages, all different cultural backgrounds and different financial status. And they are like freaked out about art. Oh, I am not creative. <laughs> of course you are. Oh, no, no, no. Somebody else is creative. No, let me break down to you, sweetie. Uh -huh. You are creative. You just got conditioned to think that you are not. But give me a few hours and I will show you otherwise because that's my mission in life. That's what I do. I stir up the pot. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, give you an example here in New Zealand. In Rotorua, we have got a thing called the Coffin Club. And the Coffin Club is literally where elderly folks come together for social uh, getting together once a week. And they're actually building their own coffins. And you wow. should, absolutely, <laughs> you should see the creativity in that. Now, each and every one of them would have said, no, I'm not creative. No, 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 come on. What do you mean? I'm an artist. You should see what they are. One girl was a petrol head. So she left her car. Now, she, her, her coffin is decked out like a Formula One uh, racing strip car. Fantastic. The other one loved Elvis. So, so on the inside of her coffin is this life-size Elvis uh, picture on there that she has oh made. My, yeah, exactly. Going and I'm going so when she together. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about creativity. And these are people. Each and every single one of them would have never described themselves as an artist. These are salt of the earth people, and it's just amazing, amazing what suddenly comes out of them when they are let loose. And, uh, well, they are, that's the key. Let it? loose. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so therefore, every, I agree with you. In all of us, there is an artist. And we typically have hidden that, that playful, creative kind of thing that is normal when we are young children that has been beaten out of us, that has been deemed, deemed wrong when you grow up. 
And that's so, so sad because my creativity since coming out of rehab has gone like an explosion of, of, of force. And it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Nowadays, I define myself with that creativity. Nowadays, if you ask me, who am I? Now, for a long time, I could have not answered that. For about two years after rehab, I could have not given you an answer. And then things started to explode. And that was creativity. And that was art that rescued me to a certain degree. That's how I define myself today. So the question is for you guys out there, what nut job are you? What <laughs> what ball are you? And wear that. Wear that. Go out there. Figure that out. That's it. I, you know, give me a run for the money when it comes to Halloween. Okay, that's odd. Why do well, I need share? Oh yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, there's a the point sharing. That's it. That's connection, and that's so important because when you're depressed, when you're down and out, you isolate yourself. You don't want anyone to see. If you're in addiction, you're hiding. You're hiding everything, the shame, the guilt, the trauma. It's all hiding, hiding. You're not coming out. Whilst when you actually get into recovery or when you, when you deal with the negative emotions in yourself, you suddenly link up with other people and you realize, whoa, they're going through similar trauma or more. And you had no idea. And here you think you're all alone. And then suddenly you you end up on an Ikebana course and you think, <laughs> okay, let's let's see, flower arranging, why not? Why won't you? And suddenly you realize, bloody hell, these are cool dudes and cool cool girls around there. And it is And you become wicked good at it too. Exactly. <laughs> and that's that's just Ikebana. And so and here you are. Obviously, you have you have gone through so much. You're you're a true thespian, a woman who loves the stage, who loves to perform. That in its own right uh, has a history, no doubt. Because some children are born like that. Uh that's true. But at the same token, it is a beautiful coping mechanism to diffuse things so as a child you would have at some stage figured out that you performing might actually put a smile on someone's face and might alter the chemistry that is going on around you uh, can you remember that this was a fact or <laughs> actually my story from back in the day it's gonna blow you away to be honest with you <laughs> and I think that you're going to be the first one out at this level of being out in the public eye for me to say and share this. I have said this story to close friends and people one-on-one -on -one that they ask about life experiences. But let's back a moment. I was born in Venezuela. So over there... People are not as tall as me, but my interracial mix that I have in the DNA, I am a bit above average. So I am 5'7", and from young age, uh, I look older than what it was because I was tall, I was well developed. Uh, my brain was out there ahead of me by years, and I didn't fit with the regular demographic to match my age. So when I was little, my biological mother, she enrolled me into classical French ballet classes. And the teacher took me because, number one, my parents were high profile back in the day. And we were paid customers. But I didn't fit the bill of a petite, too feminine ballerina. But again, I was a paid customer. And they have the annual rehearsals. And she didn't know what to do with me because I stood up like a Viking among little people. So I was Thanks. always tossed back at Aww. the end of the stage 
So by visual effect, I wasn't as big as uh -huh. the other kids on the front. And I grew up with that. So I didn't match the bill for the ballerina dancer, but I appreciate the training and the grace that you get over the years by practicing the posture, your hand mm -hmm. movements, how mm -hmm. you carry yourself, how you can go and transition to any other form of dance and hold your own, which I did that years later. Mm -hmm. But the whole first experience is that John Gare going on a stage on their uh, classical ballet recital, it just didn't settle well for me because what I just shared. <laughs> so, I had to, again, go on my quest for answers and what was going to make me happy and what it will be a good match for me. And I got into cultural dances and that did it. Nice. Because I was exposed, for example, to tango, Latin Beautiful. dances, flamenco, sevillanas, I had the opportunity in 2000 to live in Hawaii. That was a life-changing experience for me. I got kind of immediately adopted by a traditional Hawaiian family, and I got trained very formal in old tradition fashion, how to do the Hawaiian hula dance. And that was such experience. Then I got into Middle Eastern dances, and years later, I go into Japanese folk dance. And when I was living in South Florida, I was part of a performing group for the Japanese museum and garden. Uh, and the ladies who used to do the annual festivals, they were ancient. And they will go on a stage and it was so beautiful. At that time when I had this experience, I was the only white known Japanese performer going on a stage. And it was very challenging, but it was very beautiful because I had to share those moments of rehearsals and breaks and behind the scenes with 82 year old ladies that they went to war, they migrated from their homeland to United States. And the level of connection that evolved out of those sessions is, was beautiful, but it was extremely mixed feelings for me because they will not do any translation to accommodate me. I have to like pay attention and try to catch up with the step that the next one is doing. And Japanese dance is very different from Middle Eastern, Hawaiian, oh, yeah. Tahitian, okay. flamenco. I was like as lost as humanly possible. But I managed. And there were so many times that I was beyond frustrated. I cry. I say, I, I'm not going to make it to the festival. I cannot pull it off. And then I had a serious talk to myself and it's like, no, you are making it happen. You are not going to drop it. And I learned 10 dances, 10 dances for the season. And I went on a stage and I rocked my style and I stood up again because mm. I'm way too tall in comparison to Japanese demographic. <laughs> I was about to say. <laughs> and of course, and these, was, were el these were elderly ladies, so they had shrunken a bit. So there was, even if they keep themselves nice and straight and upright, you are towering them. <laughs> but I have to give you the bright side of all that. Again, I was the misfit but that gave me some advantages because when the media went to cover the event, I was the one that ended up on the newspaper picture <laughs> because I was like the sensation. Oh, you know, this tall white chick wearing mm. a kimono and she's doing as good as the other people on a stage. This is just a novelty. And okay. that got me a few times in the newspaper. Also got me into TV shows, interviews. So okay. I was all over creation back in the day. And again, <laughs> you have to embrace your weirdness, whatever you have, and wear it proudly. I cannot stress it enough. The other thing what you have just highlighted is to never 
say no to an opportunity. If you are, if life throws you some challenge or opportunity, you could have said, me, I'm white. How can I possibly ever uh, perform with Japanese? No, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I can't do that. That could have been one answer. And you could have had that door closed just because of your own misbeliefs, because your own fear to put yourself out there. And that was, I, I interviewed uh, a while ago, I interviewed a soldier who uh, was on the receiving end of some bullets in, in uh, Afghanistan. And his life had completely changed. And for a long time, he was in a dark, dark place. But then he turned and he changed. And from then on, he took every single opportunity that was given to him. When the VA said, would you like to learn how to golf? He said, sure, I will learn how to golf. Uh, he, and and why I say that, he, they also offered him uh, a comedy course. Would you like to try out some stand-up comedy? And he said, sure, why not? Guess what he is nowadays? He is a comedian, exactly. <laughs> so he would have never, ever, ever believed that. But suddenly there was an opportunity and he said, you know, fuck it. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> I take it and just see what, what happens. Let's roll with it. Here you are suddenly being on the front page because you had the, the ovaries, the backbone to go out there to actually <laughs> be uh, the person where you thought, okay, I can do that. How powerful is that? That is a I lesson to you. learn. <laughs> it is crazy. I have joke about it, but I will follow through that. I have done many things in my life. I don't have a book under my belt yet. And I will, in the future, be an author. I will make my memoirs, and I have so much juicy material that I can make it in volumes, like an encyclopedia. So I'm going to capitalize on that. Love it. Love it. <laughs> so one of the many things that have happened to me, I... <laughs> got shuffled around I, in the Boston area. I had the opportunity to do a project with the Harvard Musical Department. Somebody who was pursuing a PhD wanted to do a concert around the musical work of the last monarch in Hawaii. And the concert was going to be hosted in campus and they wanted to do kind of a hybrid production with some chanting, live music, Hawaiian hula dancers, and that's when I came along. Follow that concert. I get a few months later an email, and I'm getting invited to sing in the choir. <laughs> and I'm like, that must have been some sort of mistake. Because yes, I have done some chanting, but that's Hawaiian style. I am not formally trained in music whatsoever. That's not my specialty. And this is Harvard. So being the proper with a diplomatic background person that I am, I take the time to reply to the sender of the email with invitation. And I say, thanks for thinking about me. This must have been some sort of confusion. Yes, I have been part of a prior production hosted by Harvard, but I was in the capacity of a Hawaiian hula dancer. I am not a singer. And the lady tells me, I am taking over the department. I remember you from the concert. I was part of the production, and I would like to invite you to sing with us. And I'm like, <laughs> you must be high. So... I say to the woman, I reply by another email, and I say to her, I'm quite flattered, but I think that you are missing the fact that I'm not formally trained in music. Yeah. I cannot read musical sheet. She sends me a reply, and she gives me a date, an appointment, and she says she just wants to test out my voice, and she insists that she's going to invite me to be part of the Harvard <laughs> Musical Department. And I'm like, 
<laughs> okay, th this is, I, I don't see how is it going to work out for me, but okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to show up. That's what it counts. So I'm going to see her in person, say thank you, and show up to the world. That's what you're going to do. I get there. She asked me to sing. Well, again, I'm not a singer. That's not my thing. I can dance. I can joke around. I can do some acting, but singing, I'm terrified. And believe it or not, I'm a performer, but I don't know what to do with myself in that particular situation because that's not what I do on the normal basis. So I kind of on the spot did a verse of a Hawaiian chant that I know by heart and have helped me many, many times to come out of dark places. And I go at it and I'm like, well, how is that going to work out for me? Because this is Hawaiian chant. Again, I don't have any kind of formal training with music. And Hawaiian chanting is so different than anything else in the planet. She listens to me and she tells me, oh, you're going to sing with the Sopranos. I almost faint. <laughs> and I have four different programs, four different seasons, my name on their the soprano list of the Harvard Musical Department. <laughs> and I didn't go on stage this past May because Lady Plague took over the kingdom and run it for me. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I was already in rehearsals for the next production. If somebody told me, Two and a half years ago, that I was going to be listed under the soprano singers of Harvard. I am not part of the community. Technically, I was not part of student group. I was not teaching there. I didn't have any affiliations with the organization, except the fact that once upon a time, I was a guest performer for a particular theme project. But that's how things evolve. And here we are having this conversation. <laughs> exactly. Exactly right. So, guys, if you're in a dark place out there and if you think, oh, what the hell, what shall I do? Don't close doors that you're not sure about. Just open them a little bit further and have a look through that door and, and maybe take a little bit step through and see but maybe there is actually something there waiting for you, something that you would have never expected. And it doesn't really matter what, what it is. You might be surprised what you're good at. Because as I said, so many times we sell ourselves short we, because we have not experienced ourselves as an artist or as a singer or as someone who is actually very good with painting you or don't any know craft that's right any occupation Absolutely. for that matter because so i have to share another story with you mm. i was living in South florida at the time by then i already have been trained formally in the hawaiian hula arts and i shuffle around lived in a few different states i landed in south florida I started building up my reputation as a performer. I was not doing it at the time as extensively as I have been doing it in the past few years since I relocated to Boston. But people started talking about me. And out of nowhere, I get an email or a call. I don't remember exactly, but I got contact by somebody who was running part of the education, educational programs in the Palm Beach State College. And this person says in the message, your name came to me by somebody who knows your work. It came greatly recommended and I want you to teach in the organization. And I'm like terrified <laughs> because we're talking teaching who? I don't have any teaching experience here. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I can go and do my thing and rock my style, but teach, coach, mm -hmm. never. Mm -hmm. And the person insisted kind of got me to reconsider it and give it some serious thought. I went for it. 
And out of that, I have been ever since doing educational programs for different organizations. I have done a special teaching for the Consulate General of Japan. I have done a special programming for libraries, for colleges, art residencies for the school district. If somebody told me back in those days that I was going to be kind of hopping around states and different parts of the country doing that, I will be saying, are you drunk, high, or a combination of all the above? Because there's no way in my brain to register that it was going to happen ever. So my life has been one long chain of events, one after another. And when you say, well, what's going to come next? Okay, how much can I challenge it? <laughs> oh, brace yourself because it's coming. <laughs> and then time passes by and you're going to be like, wow, mm. how did that happen? How did I... Exactly. Came up with this. Exactly. And it is just because you're open, because you do not accept the no. You accept that there are days that are not as great as, as others. And you will accept that there are days when you have to cry, when you just don't want to get out of bed. And that's okay. Uh, a day to spend some time there and feel sorry for yourself is okay. That's absolutely fine. It's normal. Uh, but then you get yourself up, you dust yourself off, you have a shower, brush your teeth, look in the mirror and say, okay, fine, that is what happened. But now, now what? What do you do? And life is giving you opportunities, but often enough, you don't see it because you're so blinkered in, oh, poor me, poor me. No, uh, not poor me, another one. Uh, none of that, no. <laughs> And that's, that's, that's what alcoholics do, you know, oh, poor me. Look what you did to me. And because you did that, this life did that. Therefore, I drink myself to death now. I show you. Ha -ha. And that's, that's, wow. the, that's the alcoholic kind of mentality. And here you are and saying, well, actually, you know, my life has completely changed. I suddenly, there was a complete stop that I didn't like. But here you are, you have reinvented yourself over a period of months. And that is exactly what we want to share. That is exactly what we want, what I want the people out there to know. It is beautiful. It is, life is a challenge. And if you accept it and look at it with that frame of mind, with that positive energy to say, wow, that is a new mountain. Okay, so where do I climb you? How do I get over that obstacle? And that is a very different story than saying, oh my God, that's a big mountain. Oh, I don't know what to do now. Well, if you don't know what to do, that's great. You have figured out you don't know what to do. So now the question is, what? How can you, how can you find out? Well, the answer is probably connection with others because you always want to be the dumbest person of your team. So if there's a new mountain that you have no idea about, then you better find some mountain guides and actually start talking to people. And if that mountain is postnatal depression, then there are other mummies out there who have gone through it and have learned what to do. And so maybe in a, in a, in a group of mummies, you might find the answer. Or you might find the answer when you talk to your GP or family physician, because he will have had many, many others who have been in your boat with PTSD. And you might say, hey, did you know there was actually a great group there where you can talk to others who have been in the same situation? Or To that, hmm? I have to add to the conversation a few things because they are all related. Number one, we have to be mindful and conscious about resistance because there are two different kinds of resistance, in my opinion. There's a resistance that you get from the environment, whether it's the people, the circumstances, the challenges. That's one kind of resistance. But then you have your personal resistance, your doubts, your dialogue. I am not good enough. How can I pull that off? And you have this ongoing conversation that is not getting you anywhere. So you have to 
face those two resistance and make up your mind how you're going to go about it. Mm-hmm. But the main key is to acknowledge and pinpoint that. And it's funny because when it comes to the resistance from the environment at any level, being the misfit that I am, Mm. I am like, fuck yeah, I take the challenge (laughs) and I will show you better. (laughs) But sometimes I have to deal with my own resistance. That's more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. That's one. The other one is that it doesn't matter the level of resistance from you or the environment. The key is how you show up to the world and how you carry yourself. Because you might not be trained in a particular craft, but people pay attention. Are you responsible? Are you passionate? Mm. Are you a flake? Mm. Are you going to disappear? Are you committed to what you say you're gonna do? People indeed pay attention to your character. And when you show up at your best and at whatever circumstance or scenario is, you over deliver. Mm. Let me repeat this. Mm. You over deliver. That gets you to far away places. That's how I have done some serious, crazy shit that I never imagined. Because people come and they say, hey, I know this is not your thing, but somebody refer me highly of you. Would you consider this? And that's how so many things have been presented in my life. Because I have a respectable reputation on how I carry myself. And if I can know perform a task I will say sorry I am not comfortable with that or I don't have the knowledge to do that however I can endorse you to somebody who might be more qualified I don't drop the ball I don't become negligent and I always carry over in a graceful way that okay sorry I am not the right match but I want to do my contribution that you will find the right person or at least let you know that I am not the right fit. And that takes you to very far away places. There's no question on my mind. Because you show integrity. You show that you are a person that can be relied upon. And that is beautiful. And you show honesty and transparency. All these features that a leader demonstrates. And that is beautiful. Uh, people recognize it in you. There is, there is a certain manner. Uh, we, we call it in New Zealand. In, uh, yes, a, we have the same in Hawaii. Yeah, that's why there mm-hmm. is. There's just this this aura that is around you, and people recognize that. They see that first before they see anything else. You you don't even need to open your mouth because it's just the way you carry yourself and the way you look at someone will speak volumes. And that's where the 95% of, of communication is non-verbal comes in. So, no, you're so right. I 100% agree with you uh, with regards to, your, uh, to the way you are. Um, you have rephrased yourself there. That was beautiful. And also the other thing is that people become fond of you. <laughs> you get showered constantly with gifts in so many different ways. It can be invitations, it can be generous gifts, it can be just uh, a referral, recurring business, mm. getting endorsed to a bigger project. And it's very, very rewarding. It is beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Oh, Nefertiti, this was a fantastic, fantastic interview. This was such a lovely insight into the really positive way of thinking as a survivor and as a person to move away from from being a victim to being a person who can see an opportunity when it arises. And that is a very, very powerful thing. So if people want to get if people want to get hold of you, if people want to learn more about you, what can they do? Oh yes, I will love to connect. 
One way is via Facebook. I have a public figure page and it's Etnia Fusion, E-T-N-I-A-F-U-S-I-O-N by Nefertiti, N-E-F-E-R-T-I-T-I. Also, I have my email address that it's the same name, etnia.fusion at yahoo.com. E-T-N-I-A dot F-U-S-I-O-N at yahoo.com. One of those two ways, you will be delightful to connect with other people. I'm open to do virtual interviews, virtual activities, educational programs. And of course, if anybody happens to be in the area, I would love to be a tour guide and show off my beautiful city. (laughs) Beautiful. Beautiful. And guys, uh, just look down there in the description of the podcast and of the YouTube video. Uh, We will have the links in there so you can just click on that and take it easy. Nefertiti, thank you so much. That was a great interview. Thank you. It was an honor to talk to you and learn from you. Kia ora and much aloha. So delighted to be part of this episode and I look forward to seeing you soon again. Even if it's virtual, but maybe in the future we can make it happen in person. Cool. And you guys out there, look after yourself. Bye. 